Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mark Gastongay. Welcome back to MI212. We are um, going to move ahead with our next lab session today. This is the lab session that corresponds to the Advanced PKPD Part 2 lecture. And in this lab session, we're going to focus on the topic of modeling data where we have uh, multivariate endpoints, parent and metabolite data in plasma. And we'll also talk about uh, modeling data, including urine collection data in a pharmacokinetic study. Uh, so we'll have parent and metabolite data in plasma, plus metabolite data in urine. So hopefully you've all had a chance to take a look at the example. Um, I will also post the solutions after we complete the lab today. Uh, this time I, it wasn't so um, uh, so well prepared for you in, in that I was hoping that you would you would invest a little more of your effort to do the modeling this time. So I gave you um, a couple of components of the data set. You had to write your own control stream based on the code examples we provided in class and then um, attempt a couple of different models. First we were going to model the parent metabolite data in plasma and then add the, uh, the urinary metabolite collection data, and then explore the impact of uh, a covariance in the residual error using the L2 data item. So we'll go through all of that today. Starting off by um, uh, assigning this here in a new project directory on our SIMI um, user space. This is ADV PK2, or Advanced PK2, uh, and in there I have um, included all of the control streams, data sets, and so on. So let's take a look at um, the first thing, which was to create the appropriate data set. So the first effort was to create a parent metabolite data set, but also to code the L2 data item accordingly. So I've got that listed right here in this file. And um, here you see it in a text editor. What I'm going to do is copy it all. And we'll just look at this in the spreadsheet. A little bit easier to, um, to view the columns that way. Okay, so what you had to do is actually uh, on this data set where I had already given you the parent and metabolite data, all you had to do was code in the appropriate L2 column. Let's try that one more time. Ah, I chose the wrong delimiter. It's comma on that space. There we go. So if you recall, uh, we have a simple pharmacokinetic system with uh, a dose administered at time zero into compartment one. We have uh, an event ID one there, it's, it's the uh, dosing record, and then subsequently are all observations. The uh, pre-dose samples are commented out, you can see the C in the first column, those are all zero anyway. The L2 data item, what I used here, I just recopied the time column. So the L2 data item shows where there are matched pairs in time, and here's an example of one right here, at time uh, equal to 0.5, we have both the parent drug in compartment two and the metabolite in compartment three in plasma. Same thing at time one, two, four, and so on. So there's lots of uh, multivariate endpoints in this data set. So the simple way to, to add the L2 data item to this data set was just to copy over the time column. And um, the header in the data set, of course, doesn't matter. But when we, when we specify it on dollar input, we'll need to use the L2 specification. So that was the data set. <clears throat> and let's go back now and see the control stream. 
So I've saved this in one.ctl. And this control stream shows us, make it a little bit bigger, um, shows us the um, implementation of the parent metabolite model, uh, the combined simultaneous analysis, where we're going to have to fix the fraction metabolized because we're dealing with uh, an unidentifiable system. Uh, we have elimination from both parent and metabolite compartments. So we've got to fix that uh, fraction of clearance that is uh, attributed to the metabolic group. And this is very similar to the control stream I went through in class. First thing we'll try though is to run this without the L2. So you'll notice on the input statement, the last column I've just specified as drop. Uh, that allows us to include that column in the data set, but it's not going to be used in this model. And NMTRAN will just ignore it. The next run will actually try to model the L2 data item. Um, we've got three compartments then, uh, a gut, uh, a central compartment for, for the parent drug and a central compartment for the metabolite. Essentially, they're both, uh, both parent metabolite are assumed to follow a one compartment disposition model, uh, but they're linked here. And remember, we have um, the usual um, micro constants specified here because this is ADVAN5, trans1, so we have to specify all of our connections through these micro constants, K12, K23, K20, K30. We're assuming that K32 is zero here. There's no back transformation from metabolite back to parent. Okay, so we have um, a fraction metabolized, which is a parameter in the model, but it will be a fixed parameter. Um, we have clearance total. Um, that's the total clearance of chlorzoxazone, and as I mentioned in class, that would be estimated based on the parent plasma data by itself, that's probably the first thing we do. Then we try to go to this combined model. And then we'll estimate um, or we actually fix the fraction formed uh, or the fraction of clearance associated with the metabolite or biliary and other routes, uh, depending upon our prior knowledge of FM here. Um, and even if we don't know FM, we would just probably uh, fix it to a value of one and then all of our parameter estimates would be relative to that fraction. Okay, volumes of distribution for parent metabolite compartment. We have a, a lag uh, time on the absorption and so on. So the, the key here is that we're going to model um, both analytes simultaneously. We have a CMT data item, the compartment data item, so we can use that to flag our indicator switch. And all we're gonna say here is that indicator is zero, uh, but if compartments three, indicator is one, that means indicator is one for metabolite and it's zero for parent. We'll specify a prediction model for the metabolite, a prediction model for the parent. With a residual error, we have a combined additive and proportional on both. And then we use that indicator variable to switch between parent and metabolite predictions, depending upon what type of observation it is. Okay, so that's the starting point. <clears throat> Initial estimates here. Um, I just uh, pulled these from some prior analysis. Um, if you read the paper that I signed this week, you could probably grab these parameters from that paper. Uh, but uh, one of the things we're going to need to do is fix the fraction metabolized. We're going to start with a diagonal omega and diagonal sigma. So just the variances are estimated here. And we're going to run, um, just for interest of time, the FO method with post hoc. We'll try to run a covariance step and then uh, create some tables for plotting. So let's save that. And now we need to go to the R script. Uh, I've got a script here called advpk2.r. Let's edit. And we'll need to run the header here, which loads all the libraries we need. So we'll just evaluate that. and then set a project directory and the non-mem run command. Those are gonna be consistent throughout this session. So we'll just save them as variables. And then our first run here, we're gonna run uh, 
1.ctl, this is the parent metabolite in plasma. And remember in non-R we have this plotting option uh, which calls the, the function plot R, but we can group the plots by a variable. We're going to group by compartment here. And the only thing that really applies are compartments uh, for which observations are made. And so we have two of those, and we're going to label them as parent in plasma and metabolite in plasma. That would be compartment 2 and 3, respectively. So let's run this. So the compile has completed successfully. When, when you get the message that the exit code is zero, that means there are no errors. If the exit code is non-zero, there's probably going to be an error message in the run directory. And you can go back. There's usually a text file that captures those error messages. OK. So the run's complete and plotting's complete. Let's go back to the home directory. And we'll look at that plot. So this, this actually, let's look at the output first. Uh, so let's refresh. And we'll look at run one and the list file here. Echoes back the control stream we ran. Identifies um, that we're running first order. And then we see the monitoring of search. Uh, again, we want to look at the gradient over time, first making sure we have no zero gradients and that that gradient is decreasing in absolute value uh, throughout the iterations. <clears throat> looks okay, looks pretty stable. Minimization was successful, although we have a parameter near boundary, so that might be addressed. So let's take a look. And you see at the end here, yeah, I can tell you which parameter it was because we did hit a zero gradient. It's the second to last parameter of the model. Um, as you see here, is zero gradient. Um, it switches to zero right here about the 55th iteration. And that's probably because it's, it's slamming up against the boundary. This is going to be one of the residual error components. So let's look at the parameter estimates and see what we can learn. So um, fixed effects parameters are listed here. Um, we've got, uh, I think that's an absorption rate constant of about 0.5, a clearance, total clearance of about 18 liters per hour, uh, and so on. Let's look for uh, a potential boundary and um, probably going to show up in the epsilon. So the, the omega matrix here looks good. Remember, we're assuming that the off diagonals are zero. This is a diagonal matrix only. But when we look at the residual random effects, you can see where the problems are. Uh, we have one, two, which are a proportional and additive component for parent. Then we have a proportional and additive component for metabolite. Look at the, um, look at the value of the metabolite random, uh, residual random effect for the proportional component. It's 10 to the minus 5. So there's a problem there somehow, and uh, um, we'll t have to take a closer look. But epsilon 3, if we go back to the model, the variance of epsilon 3 was, was negligibly small, 10 to the minus fifth. That's associated with the proportional component for the metabolite. So let's look at the diagnostic plots, and then uh, maybe we, can, uh, we could go back and fix that. The diagnostic plots are in the parent directory, and here's the diagnostic for um, for the first run, 1.pdf. And while that's loading, I'll answer, answer a couple of questions. So one question says, when we see parameters near boundary, it doesn't necessarily mean the final estimate but could be just in the estimation process. Uh, no, that's not what I was saying. Um, it, it can be, um, you, you can uh, bounce off the boundaries or come close to the boundaries during the search, but it's possible that, uh, that then the parameter search could pull away from the boundary and find a, 
uh, a well-defined minimum. Uh, this example here showed a parameter that hit the boundary and stayed there for the last 50 iterations or so. Um, and, uh, and we saw that the boundary that it was hitting is, is actually zero. Um, remember, the variance terms are, are constrained to be positive, and so that 10 to the minus fifth was approaching uh, a value of zero. Uh, just a question about the coding uh, using the, the labels Y1 and Y3. Yeah, that, those, um, the, only, the only variables that's really understand by, understood by NM Tran is the, um, let me pull the control strain up. The only variable in, in, in this block here that's understood is Y. Uh, and of course, A2 is recognized, A3 and, and uh, V2, V3 and those sorts of things. But um, it, when I'm defining these different predictions, I just called it Y3 and Y1. Uh, it's probably a little sloppy because I should I really meant that Y1 was associated with the parent uh, so maybe we should call it Y2, but it doesn't matter. That's just a user-defined variable. As long as you keep it straight in your mind, that's fine. The thing that really matters is Y. That's, that's recognized by Anim Tran, but these other predictions are not recognized. Okay, so let's look at the plots. Oh, we're still stuck there. Let's go back. <clears throat> now here it is okay so this is split up by different analytes first is the prediction and observed values for parent drug in plasma okay so you see here uh, population observed versus predicted and individual uh, observed versus predicted and uh, Looks like a decent fit, not really biased, but you do see uh, heteroscedastic variability uh, that's shrunken in by the individual um, by the individual eta estimation in the post hoc step. Um, you see that same pattern here on the residuals versus predicted. When you go to con to the uh, weighted residuals, that cone shape pattern disappears. So we've got the right weighting structure. Um, looks like a decent fit there for the parent drug. Next, we have metabolite, and metabolite shows even more variability, um, it appears, uh, but most of that is inter-individual here. As you see, the individual ADAs really shrink that down to a solid uh, prediction. Um, a little bias trend there with the metabolite, um, potentially, uh, where we're showing residuals that are slightly negative towards the higher end of the prediction range. And uh, similar potential bias here in the plots versus time. But overall, I guess, looks okay. Uh, we've got eta scatter plots to look where we might have covariance. And these seem to be pretty independent. I don't see any really strong relationships here. Although eta 1, eta 2, maybe there's something there um, we, could, we could include and, and try to run a covariance. Uh, we've got a small population here, but it doesn't look like our etas are all that well-centered. Difficult to tell. I think we've only got like 20 subjects, so uh, um, it's hard to, to get a, a, a solid distribution of ADAs there. But there might be something going on here where there's maybe a, a covariate that needs to be included. Unfortunately, we don't have that in our data set just yet. Density plots show some, some bumps and some, some non-normality, but overall, not too far. Not too far off. Not bad. Okay. So that's the model with uh, parent and metabolite simultaneously estimated, two different residual variance models. Uh, we did hit a boundary on that, and maybe we'll rectify that on the next run. Um, but the other thing we could do is, is uh, since we've gotten this far, why don't we model the L2 correlation? So in order to do that, we'll look at number two dot control. And, um, and before I address that uh, boundary problem uh, with the random effect that was being driven towards zero, I'm going to investigate what happens when we allow for residual correlation here. And so the difference, and I've got it in the comment at the top, is that we're going to estimate L2 covariance. 
L2 is that la last column of the data set. Now I'm going to actually identify it as L2, which is recognized by NMTRAN. And then we're going to specify the model in the exact same way, except for the error block, where now I have to reorder. Uh, because I'm going to look at correlation of the proportional terms, so that's error 1 and error 2, and then um, correlation of the, of the additive terms, error 3 and error 4, between the parent and metabolite. So I had to renumber those epsilons in order to make that work, because down here we're going to do two sigma blocks. And the first block represents the correlation in the proportional components, and the second block represents the potential correlation in the additive components. Let's leave it like that for now and we'll see what happens um, before, we, before we refine the residual variance model anymore. And we'll leave the omegas as diagonals for now um, to keep things simple. So I'll save that run. And now we'll go, oops, now we'll go to the um, R script and we'll run number two. structure of this call in non-R is just like we did in the first one. I'm going to submit the run. It's going to compile and then execute. While that's running, I'll answer a few questions. In the lecture, you mentioned that Avan 6, we use Avan 6 if not all the processes are first order. And the TMDD model, I mentioned that, that it was second order in there. Why is it, what is second order? Or do you mean zero order? No, there's a second order um, rate constant in the TMDD model. Um, the full TMDD model, if you recall, uh, the formation of the drug receptor complex is driven by both the concentration of free drug and free target. So the free drug and free target are multiplied by that K on. Uh, so that's a second order rate constant. You can't model that in ADVAN 5 or 7. You need to go to the differential equation models for that one. Okay, again, ex ask, asking me to explain a little bit more about the boundary issue. Um, I'll, I'll show you when we go to the output how we can identify where the problems are. Uh, but the boundary here is just, is just signifying that there's a parameter that's, that's not moving anymore in the search. And it's run up against one of the limits. And it could be a limit that we set on the initial estimates. As you recall that uh, in dollar theta, we can specify lower and upper bounds. Uh, although it's not recommended that you do that unless there's a real physiologic or physical chemical boundary there. Um, but there's also an, an implied boundary on all of the variance terms uh, and the way that this is done internally in non-MEM, uh, the variance estimates are constrained to be positive. So there's a boundary at zero. So any um, variance term that's approaching zero is going to be identified as being near its boundary. And that's what we're seeing here. If we don't specify L2, non-MEM will assume all, two, all L2 records are different or independent. That's right. So without L2, uh, it's assuming that all residual errors are independent. Um, OK. So let's look at the results here. Run 2 is completed. Go back to the uh, home page. And we do have to refresh, come back. And here's run 2, the list file. So same thing now, except we have L2 correlation. So we are estimating two um, additional parameters, the covariance parameters. This takes a few more iterations because we're, we're trying to estimate more. Minimization was successful. And again, we've got something near a boundary. And so let's take a look at that. Now, one thing we could look at here, yeah, it looks like we hit a gradient, a zero gradient up here. One, two, three, four, five, parameter number six. It's hit a zero gradient. And again here, uh, so we could take a look at that one. Um, otherwise, there are no there are no other zero gradients. I'm just rolling back to see. See that was positive here, 
positive here, here, and right here it turns zero. So that might be something to look at. The other thing I should say too is let's, you gotta be careful about um, dropping parameters or worrying about boundaries when we're running the FO method. The FO method, of course, uh, makes the assumption that all variance terms uh, are, are describing an eta equal to zero. So the expected value of eta is equal to zero. The variance terms are expected to be zero. So um, I wouldn't throw out any parameters or give up on this model until we ran it with a more rigorous estimation method. I'm just not going to do that in this class uh, due to time constraints, but that's something you could try on your own. So you look at this and um, uh, interestingly, when we add that L2 correlation, I don't see any, any real problems in the inter-individual random effects. All of those variances are reasonable. In the uh, residual random effects, we see now a full block being estimated uh, for, well, not a full block, a block between um, the proportional components, and those are reasonable, and, and then a block between the additive components. Now, we could calculate the correlation coefficient, but one thing you see is, is that now that this uh, covariance has been allowed, this random effect, which is driven close to zero, is no longer at that boundary. So it's changed the estimate of the random effect. Uh, again, I, I'd like to see what happens under FOCE here before we make any final decisions, but you do see that um, inclusion of that L2 uh, residual error correlation allows us to possibly refine the estimates of the residual variances. Let's take a look at the diagnostics. This is model two. And so this is parent and metabolite with the L2 correlation. And you know, the goodness of it is just about the same as it was before um, with these plots. Still looks pretty good. It's hard to discern the impact of L2 correlation on the goodness of fit plots. What really happens is, is maybe uh, an improvement in, in the random effect distributions and maybe a better description of the random variability when you apply the model to a um, simulation-based diagnostic, such as a predictive check. Uh, and that, that's where you might see the real advantage. Again, ADA distributions uh, look about the same as before. So not, not a big change in the model there, although we were able to uh, avoid that, that boundary problem um, with the residual random effect. Let me get the next model started, and then I'll come back and ask, answer a few questions. Um, well, actually, while we're on this model, let's, let's, let's answer the questions now. So um, next question. If we estimate the correlation between epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 in the block, is it counted as an additional parameter and thereby incurring a penalty? Otherwise, what's the advantage to estimate the correlation? Okay, well, I, I don't really view this as a penalty. Remember, what we're doing now is we're estimating um, the, the covariance rather than fixing it at zero. So in other words, you know, would, would you, would you uh, penalize yourself for estimating a parameter that should be estimated um, when otherwise you're fixing it at some known value or that you think is a known value? Um, and, and also, uh, I would not use the objective function to decide whether or not to include this. Whether or not the objective function drops, uh, if you have a successful convergence and a non-zero or um, a non-important, non um, so a, a covariance term that's non-zero, then you've actually added value to your estimation. You've described the variability better. If that correlation coefficient turns out to be close to zero, then it's probably not worthwhile to include it. But if it's, if it's non-zero, um, it doesn't matter to me what the objective function is. That's a better description of the variance model than fixing it to some known value. Of course, you have to consider model stability. And if you're having difficulty with convergence by modeling that sigma block, uh, you might consider simplifying. If you have a zero gradient once in the intermediate steps, 
should that be a cause for concern? Not not really. If if, you, if the gradient flashes to zero just once and, and then works its way out of that, uh, it could be that uh, for that iteration, the model was at a saddle point in the parameter search and got around it. What you have to be concerned with is is a, a gradient that's zero from top to bottom. That's that's certainly a problem. Or one that, that does end up at zero uh, and, and, and maybe spend some time at a zero value um, uh, in more than one iteration. Okay, uh, next run then is the full model with the parent metabolite and urine data. Let's look at the data set first. So I'll just describe how this was constructed in a minute. What well, what we did here is we added the parent metabolite plasma data to the urine collection data and added the L2 data item. But there's one subtle caveat here, and, and I'll explain that in a minute. So first you see here that uh, compartments uh, 2 and 3 are parent and metabolite respectively compartment one is still dosing. That's the same as before. We've inserted the compartment four records and the compartment negative four records. Remember, we're turning on the compartment. This is event ID two, so there's no observation or dose here. We're just turning on the compartment. And then at the end of the urine collection interval here at eight hours, we're turning off, we're making the observation first of the amount of drug collected in urine, uh, then turning off the compartment with a negative four, then turning it back on, collecting again until 24 hours and turning it off, etc. Uh, and we do that throughout. And some of these uh, individuals had urine collections uh, up to 48, um, 72 hours even. Uh, it depends on the individual and, and, uh, and how, how far they were followed. Um, now, the L2 data item again is a copy of the time column and, and that works in this case for all of the parent metabolite in plasma pairs. But there's one place where it doesn't work, and that's down here where if you had copied the time column, um, you would have made all three of these the same L2 data items. So this would be parent drug in plasma, parent drug, um, metabolite in plasma, and metabolite in urine. Now, I'm not going to model. My, my hypothesis here is that there's, there's some correlation or covariance in the residual error in the plasma data because they come from the same sample at the same time. Now, the urine collection data, well, that's a different situation altogether. It's not the same plasma sample. Um, it was collected over the same amount of time, but I'm not going to view that as one of the elements of this multivariate endpoint. I'm going to view that as an independent. And you could, you could test that and... and, and uh, and see how the model performs if you do allow that correlation. But what I did in order to, to break that urine data from being included was I set the L2 item for that to some other number. I just stuck in a one here. Uh, so we have eight, eight for the parent metabolite and plasma, and then we have one for the urine data. Uh, and that, that forces this one to be independent from, from these two. Okay, so that's, that's the little trick to this data assembly. Of course, if you, were, if you wanted to assume that you had correlation across all three, um, you, you would want them to all be the same in the L2 data item. So you'd have 888 instead of 881 uh, or 88 whatever. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the difference here. Okay, so let's quit that one. And uh, we'll look at the model structure. That's model 10 now is the uh, full model with parent metabolite and urine data. Here's 10. And the usual structure here, we're not going to model the L2 initially. We're going to just assume independence of residuals. And you see here, this is parent metabolite and urine population data. We need to add an additional compartment to the model now, the urine collection compartment, which is compartment four. Um, we're not fixing the fraction metabolized. Now we, we have an identifiable system, and so we can estimate uh, both the clearance, the metabolic clearance of 
chlorzoxazone and the biliary and other clearance because we have a mass balance in this system. And this is assuming that the metabolite is 100% excreted in the urine. We've got a complete mass balance for that metabolite. Um, just as before, we have a similar situation where we're going to specify uh, observed and predicted values. One thing that, that's uh, key here is our scale for compartment four, which is the metabolite in the urine amount is set to one because it's an amount, it's not a concentration. And so if we were to define the concentrations in each one of these, well, actually it's concentration in compartment two, concentration in compartment three, but amount in compartment four. We use our indicator variables, which are keyed to the compartment number, just like we did before. And now we have three different predictions, uh, metabolite, parent, and urine, and then an indicator which switches between each one of those. We don't have to fix any parameters now. All of our parameters are being estimated. We're going to run a diagonal omega and a diagonal sigma, so just the variances will be estimated. Okay, so let's see what happens with that one. That's run number 10. We're going to also indicate in the grouping now we have an, an additional group name. So we have parent in plasma, metabolite in plasma, and the metabolite in urine. So that'll just split our plots into three different batches. Okay, so that run is compiling now and running. Let me answer a few more questions while that's going. Can the L2 be missing or zero for dose events? Sure, it can. You need something in every column, so, but it, you could use a missing or character, a period, or a zero. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, L2 is not uh, pay, it, it doesn't mean anything on dosing records. Yeah, two urine measurements in the data, although they're not collected at they're not collected at different times, but they're processed in a similar way. Should have the same L2. Um, well. I think you mean that we have two urine collection intervals and uh, they're collected at different in different time intervals. So I would not consider them part of a multivariate endpoint. Um, I, and I think it's pretty safe to assume that those urine collection uh, observations uh, are independent. Um, if there was something we're measuring in urine in addition to amount of drug, maybe uh, this is something that... Um, uh, maybe maybe it's a, an agent for uh, treating uh, type 2 diabetes and we might want to monitor urinary glucose or, or something like that. Um, that would be a correlated measure. And so then we could, we could capture those because that would be from the same collection interval. But right now we're talking about urine collection intervals that are distinct. And, and I think it's reasonable to assume that the residual errors are independent on those. Okay, run 10 is complete. Let's take a look. Uh, it's just to refresh. We go to 10 and look at the list file. We have an additional analyte now. Um, minimization is successful. Again, we have a, a boundary issue. Um, same one as we saw with run number one. It's, that, it's the uh, proportional component of the metabolite and uh, parameter estimates are all quite similar to what they were before uh, and that's because our fixed estimate of the fraction metabolized is, is, is uh, on target. Um, but we see here um, th this is the one that's causing trouble, 10 to the minus 5 for the proportional component of the metabolite residual error model. We saw that with, uh, with the parent metabolite alone. It doesn't go away when we add the urine data. But it, remember, it did go away when we looked at L2 correlation. Um, so let's run the model with L2 correlation now. And that would be number 11. So we're going to unmask that, uh, change the input line from drop to L2 to indicate that we're going to use that column of the data now. Uh, and that's a, you know, that's a trick you can use anytime you want to ignore certain elements of the input data file is just on dollar input is to label the header drop and that will be ignored. 
it's also a way to uh, overcome some of the limits in the numbers of uh, data items allowed, although NonMem7 now has bumped that up to 50, which is, uh, which is quite generous. Um, so here we go again. We had to renumber the residual error. And what I did is renumbered just the parent and metabolite residuals. So 1, 2, 3, 4 now represent the, the proportional components of parent metabolite followed by the additive components of parent metabolite respectively. And the residual for urine data is followed by 5 and 6. This is one we're not going to model in that covariance. So again, you have to number them in such a way that you can arrange the blocks. This first block is for the proportional on parent metabolite and plasma. The second block is for the additive on parent and metabolite and plasma. And this third component here is, is not a block. It's just a, a diagonal sigma. And it represents the um, proportional and additive pieces of the residual variance for urinary data. Okay, so that's the difference here. Um, if we wanted to model this in, in a three-way block, we'd have to number it. We'd have to order them differently, of course. But this way, we have parent metabolites still maintaining the correlation, whereas the urine data are independent in their residuals. Let's see what happens with that run. So the run is being compiled now, uh, and we'll go to execution. Somebody's asking, I, I coded L2 using the same value as time. Could it be a different variable? It sure could. It can be any number you'd like. Remember, the key is that the L2 is viewed with on, within only an individual record, and the individual record means all of the rows assigned to one individual. Uh, any place that L2 is the same on contiguous records will identify potential residual correlation. Any other values can be used on all the other lines. And so the, the, the exact character you use there, whether it's the, the, the time or just any other number, um, it doesn't really matter. You could, you could use anything you want as long as you follow those rules. Yeah, um, also asking about the control stream here. Why do we need to define C2, C3, and C4? And uh, it's true in the code that I was using here, we never used that. C2, C3, and C4 are, are defined here, and they represent the, the conditional, well, actually in this case here would be the prediction under FO with post hoc for um, the parent, the metabolite, and the urinary data. I never use those because we have the CMT item and I'm just using F here in the prediction, but we could substitute them. So for example, instead of Y, instead of F here, we could just be explicit and write C2. And instead of Y3, we could write C3. I'm sorry, instead of F for Y4, we could write C4. That would be equivalent. Um, the compartment data item is doing the work for us here. And it, and it switches the meaning of F depending upon whatever CMT is. Uh, but if you want it to be explicit, you could just use these directly. I tend to, when I'm dealing with a multi-analyte system or a multi-compartmental system, sometimes I tend to want to plot these anyway just so I can trace what's happening in each compartment over time. If L2 is in the data, does sigma block have to be coded in the block? Um, yeah, if there's no L, if there's no sigma block, then there's no way for that correlation to be modeled. So you need both pieces. You need the L2 data item in, in the data set, and you need to allow for the covariance to be modeled in sigma. Okay. Let's go to the um, results for this run. Um, Refresh again, and back. And here we see the um, results echoing back our control stream. First order method, again, looking for zero gradients. I don't see any yet. Here's one popping up. 
Again, it's the same one that we had trouble with before. And so we go to the final estimates. These are similar to where we were. Um, we have this inter-individual random effect here that's being driven to quite small a value. Uh, and maybe that's something we need to be concerned with. Uh, and then we also have now, it's switched to, to, a different, uh, to a different part of the model, but it looks like the additive piece, the additive component of the parent drug residual error is, oh, I'm sorry, this is the proportional component. It's the same one, the proportional component of the um, metabolite. Remember, we reordered, so this is proportional parent, proportional metabolite, additive parent, additive metabolite, and then proportional and additive for the urine data. So this is the one that's causing trouble again, is that proportional piece in the um, uh, metabolite plasma data. So before I uh, throw that variance term away or simplify the model, I'd want to run this with a full FOCE interaction type uh, estimation method just to make sure and uh, sometimes you'll see these things go away when you use a more rigorous estimation method. But that would be the next step here is to, is to ex explore a better estimation method. <clears throat> okay, any more questions? Let's see. If L2 is in the control stream but there's no blocking for sigma, Will it just ignore L2 or will it cause a run error? And you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I think it will cause a run error. I think non-mem is smart enough to catch that, um, but the user should, should be smart enough to catch it. We could try it right now and see what happens. Um, so let's take run number two. And I'll save it as three. And we'll do that very thing. We'll just convert this to a sigma not a sigma block. So now we have four diagonal elements of sigma. And um, actually, non-R will, will capture all the run numbers for you, but I'll, I'm gonna change them just to be sure here. Um, three, three. So all, all I've done here is I've left L2 exposed, but I've converted the sigma from the double block structure we had to just a single diagonal structure. And the question was, is, there, is this going to cause a runtime error or is it, is it going to uh, proceed? And then the, it's up to the user to determine that there was an error. Uh, I think I'm smart enough to catch this, but let's see what happens. So let me, I'll just stick it in right here. Number two, and I'll call this three. Parent metabolite plasma with L2 in data, but not, uh, but no sigma block. Okay, so let's see what happens. Three. I'll save that and let's give it a run. Well, it compiled without, without an error. So um, that would tell me that it's, that it's proceeding without, without catching that problem. And the run is continuing to move ahead here. So let's see. And it exited with an, with an exit code 0, 02. So that looks like no error. Let's take a look at run number three. And um, let's look at the at the output here just to see how it's interpreted. So the L2 data item is recognized. See this in the output? L2 data item is item number eight. So it's there. And um, NIMM recognizes that there is level two correlation, but there's no place to put it. There's no parameter to estimate. So this proceeds without any, without any hiccups. 
Um, and um, the problem is, is that there's no way to estimate the parameter. Uh, we're, we're saying that those two are L2 correlated. And in effect, what we're doing is, is saying there's a part of the residual covariance matrix um, that's, uh, that's present. There's an L2 correlation, but we're fixing it to zero. So just like any other model parameter that we might want to estimate, um, if you run it and it's fixed at zero, um, that's, that's a possibility. So that's, that's really what we're doing here is we're forcing it to be fixed to zero. Um, it's not a useful thing to do uh, in that uh, it sort of defeats the purpose of trying to model the residual correlation. But you'll see you don't even get a warning message. Probably should be a warning message there to alert the user that they've only gotten half of it down uh, you need both the L2 data item and you need the, the block matrix. Okay, so that's, that's it for this uh, homework problem. Um, I'd advise you to all give it a shot. Try to run this with conditional estimation as well, uh, but the, the model structures can be the same. Uh, I'll pause for a moment for additional questions. And then if any of you have time and would like to stay on, uh, I'm also going to record a, a, another segment here where I'm going to review the answers to the exam you just took. Um, we, have, we didn't really have time to do that uh, in, in the regular schedule, and I'm just going to take a few minutes to do that at the end of this lab, and I'll post that recording also. So any further questions on the lab session? All right, looks kind of quiet there. So let's shift gears. I'm going to um, actually make this two separate recordings. So I'm going to stop this recording, and uh, and then we'll start up the um, we'll start up the lab session. I'm sorry, we'll start up.